We pulled out 8,000 Israelis who were living in the Gaza Strip. We gave the keys to the Palestinians and we said, good luck. You want to create a state? Let's see what a peaceful, prosperous area you can turn Gaza into. And we had dreams of creating the Singapore of the Middle East. And there was every opportunity for the Palestinians to turn the Gaza Strip into an amazing economic powerhouse. And you know what's really outrageous? We told people to go to the humanitarian zone because Hamas isn't already embedded there. And Hamas has now fired over a hundred rockets at our communities from inside the humanitarian zone. And not a single UN agency, not a single UN official has condemned Hamas for shooting rockets at our towns and cities out of the humanitarian zone. Gaza's problem has never been resources. It's been priorities. And Gaza decided to prioritize the October 7 massacre. Now, we're saying the day after Hamas, three things have to happen to create a future of peace and prosperity. The Israel-Palestine conflict is often presented by Western media in such a way that even when Israel defends itself against centuries of barbaric violence, it is somehow portrayed as the aggressor. However, we at Chitti Media and in India, and particularly Hindus, understand Israel's perspective because we have been subject to the same kind of cruelty that Israel witnessed on 7th October for centuries. Our conversation today with Mr. Elon Levy the well-known spokesperson from uh, the Prime Minister of Israel's office, is therefore not to disdainfully or arrogantly finger-wag at Israel during what is an exceptionally difficult time for that country, but to rather allow for an articulate Israeli voice to uh, share perspectives and help others better understand perspectives which are often ignored by Western media or deliberately sidelined. Namaste. My name is Kamal Mahdi Shetty and you're watching Chitti Media. And I would like to welcome on our show today, Mr. Elon Levy. Namaste and Shalom, uh, Elon. Welcome to Chitti Media. Namaste and Shalom. Thank you, Elon, for joining us today. Um, I want to begin this conversation uh, by paying our respects uh, to not only the innocent Palestinian civilians who have lost their lives because Hamas has used them as human shields, uh, but also by remembering the many Israelis, mostly Jewish people, but also uh, Muslims and Christians who have been killed by terrorist attacks. And again, not just on the 7th of October, but for many years. My question to you, uh, Elon, is not about history, uh, nor is it about individual tragedies. Uh, it is actually about the ideological source of this conflict, which I feel uh, perhaps the West does not fully understand. Uh, can you share with us why an independent and successful Jewish homeland uh, in the place of its historical origin is such a hated concept by those who seek to destroy you? Israel and India share something very profound in common. We are both democratic, non-Muslim nation states living in our ancient homeland with a rich and ancient civilization in regions that have been historically dominated by Muslim empires. If you look at the map of the Middle East from Morocco all the way to Iran is one big sea of Muslim countries and only one minority has been able to reclaim its independence in its ancient homeland where we have an over 3000 year old history and that's the Jewish people. The Druze weren't able to do it. The Kurds weren't able to do it. The Jewish people are the only ones who managed to stand up and reclaim their independence and their dignity and their equality in a huge region of Arab countries. And so there are many people who, for nationalist reasons or religious reasons, do not accept the idea of a Jewish state anywhere in the land of Israel or anywhere in the Middle East. And we see that in protests around the world when people chant from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. They're not talking about creating a Palestinian state next to Israel. They're talking about another Arab state instead of Israel. Because for reasons of very deep historical religious hatred and bias, they do not think 
that the Jewish people should have their own free, independent, and sovereign country in our ancient homeland. They want us to return to being poor, oppressed, and subjugated minorities. And that will never happen. So because we fight back, because we tell them no, because we stand tall and insist on our rights, we suffer a lot of hatred and persecution and many people who want to see our country wiped off the map. Right. It is uh, clear, Elon, that the enemies of your country will stop at nothing in order to harm you. And we in India believe that uh, this is a fight that you must not win just for yourselves, but uh, for all civilized societies. But my question is, how do you intend to take on so many enemies who are all mm -hmm. working together behind the scenes uh, through multiple proxies and with such a gigantic propaganda machinery that is deeply embedded in media, academia um, and civil society? How are you going to win this war in the long term? The October 7th massacre was a horrific moment that reminded us just the sort of brutal violence that our enemies are happy to use against us. And I say happy because when you watch the videos of the Hamas atrocities, how they burned and beheaded people, you can hear them laughing and you can hear them singing. This is brutal, brutal, cruel and sadistic violence. And it's a reminder of what we are facing and why we are having to fight, not only to defend ourselves from the last October 7th, but to defend ourselves from the massacres that Hamas is plotting against us. And we know that we are fighting for humanity, not only for the basic human right to sleep in your bed and not be abducted or murdered, but because the free world and the whole of humanity must send a clear message to terrorists that you cannot burn whole families alive. You cannot torture children in front of their parents. You cannot rape little girls and get away with it. And so our war is a war to bring the October 7th monsters to justice. Now, unfortunately, we're coming up against a very big campaign around the world that wants Hamas to get away with it, that wants to give an amnesty to the monsters who perpetrated those crimes against humanity and don't want Israel to bring them to justice. And our job is to keep reminding people of the horrors that Hamas perpetrated on October 7th and what the consequences to the rest of the world will be if violent terrorists receive the message that you can murder innocent people with the sort of violence we saw on October 7th, the people of India are no strangers to from terror attacks in the past and get away with it. So we know that we are fighting for humanity and we need our allies to stand firm and loud and make it clear that we have a right to win this war, not only for ourselves, but for the sake of the whole world. You know, you mentioned uh, the global campaign against Israel. And one of the things that uh, this campaign completely ignores and doesn't talk about is how the Hamas uses people as human shields. Uh, could you please explain to our viewers um, the exact tactics that Hamas uses in deploying uh, human shields, uh, people as human shields? Uh, what exactly do they do? Uh, you know, I've seen, I've heard about uh, people not being allowed to leave their homes. Uh, I've seen visuals of uh, blockades on the roads. Um, tell us exactly what they do so that, you know, we can actually understand how this is done. Hamas's human shield strategy is so much worse than you're describing, because not only does Hamas prevent people from evacuating civilian areas, it spent 16 years deliberately embedding its terror infrastructure underneath civilian facilities. They have built tunnel shafts and command centers and weapon silos underneath schools, under homes, under universities, under kindergartens, under hospitals, under mosques. And as our soldiers go through the Gaza Strip, they are uncovering evidence of Hamas's crimes against humanity. We found tunnel shafts underneath children's beds. We found weapons and missiles inside children's mattresses. We found tunnels leading from a university to a school and weapons manufacturing facilities inside mosques and booby traps with cables leading to clinics. Because Hamas's whole strategy is to attack our people and then hide behind their women and children in order to evade justice so we can't get to them. 
And then what happens if people, innocent people, get hurt? That creates images for international TV. That generates international sympathy. That generates diplomatic pressure. And they hope that that will force Israel to stop and Hamas will be able to get off the hook. Israel is doing everything it can to minimize civilian casualties. Hamas is doing everything it can to maximize civilian casualties. It's part of Hamas's strategy to sacrifice innocent civilians in order to get sympathy and force Israel to stop defending itself. And we're now fighting a unique challenge. No army in the history of the world has fought a counter-terror war in an urban area against an enemy that has spent nearly 20 years embedding itself under civilian areas. And we have found 1,500 tunnel shafts in Gaza, almost all of them, in schools, homes, hospitals, and mosques. So that is Hamas's human shield strategy. And it's a sad fact that everyone who has been killed since Hamas declared war with the October 7 massacre would still be alive if Hamas had not declared this war, if Hamas were not fighting this war from inside densely populated civilian areas, and no one else needs to be hurt if Hamas simply surrenders. And we think that everyone who wants the fighting to stop should be demanding an immediate and unconditional Hamas surrender so that the terrorists who burned, beheaded, and raped innocent people on October 7th can be brought to justice. Right. Uh, Elon, if I'm not wrong, you have served in the IDF and have some knowledge of the IDF airstrikes. Uh, could you please tell us how civilians are informed about impending airstrikes? Because I've heard about things like uh, roof knocks, uh, but I was also surprised to know that uh, you also actually call people on their mobile phone, um, asking them to evacuate before such strikes. Because Israel is fighting a terror army that has embedded itself in civilian areas, we are having to make unprecedented efforts to try to keep civilians safe. Civilians on the other side, to keep them safe from their own leaders. And so our officers and soldiers make individual phone calls to Palestinians telling them, we are launching a ground offensive, you need to get out of the area. We send them text messages. We send recorded voice calls. We've dropped over 10 million leaflets urging people to get out of the way. We could have launched a ground offensive immediately while people were still in Gaza City. But that would have caused untold civilian casualties and we don't want people to be hurt. We're fighting this war because we want the suffering to end. So our army ended up surrendering the element of surprise that would have given us a military advantage in order to give civilians a chance to evacuate. We've put in place tactical pauses to help civilians get out of Hamas strongholds. We have secured safe passage for civilians to leave areas of fighting. We've designated a whole area as a humanitarian zone where we want people to go to escape fighting. And you know what's really outrageous? We told people to go to the humanitarian zone because Hamas isn't already embedded there. And Hamas has now fired over a hundred rockets at our communities from inside the humanitarian zone. And not a single UN agency, not a single UN official has condemned Hamas for shooting rockets at our towns and cities out of the humanitarian zone. And while we're doing our best to keep civilians safe and protected, we think these UN agencies and officials are culpable with the loss of life. Because instead of sending people into the humanitarian zone we designated to keep people safe, they're sending them into Hamas strongholds instead. And the UN is therefore complicit with Hamas's strategy of using human shields. Elon, if I can take you back to 2005, uh, when Israel left Gaza, as uh, everyone knows, uh, could you please tell us about the state in which you left Gaza? the infrastructure you built, um, the initiatives, the economic initiatives that were taken, and what happened after you left? Um, and also, if you could also explain why Israel had to blockade Gaza a few years after, um, you know, leaving it. That's such an important point. I think actually most people forget 
that Israel pulled out of the Gaza Strip. In 2005, we pulled out the army. We pulled out 8,000 Israelis who were living in the Gaza Strip. We gave the keys to the Palestinians and we said, good luck. You want to create a state? Let's see what a peaceful, prosperous area you can turn Gaza into. And we had dreams of creating the Singapore of the Middle East. And there was every opportunity for the Palestinians to turn the Gaza Strip into an amazing economic powerhouse. But the next year, the Palestinian people voted for Hamas a violent terror organization in their legislative elections. And the next year in 2007, Hamas overthrew the Palestinian Authority in a violent coup and seized control of the Gaza Strip. And Hamas then turned the Gaza Strip not into the Singapore of the Middle East, but into a giant launch pad for launching attacks against Israel, for shooting rockets against us, for digging tunnels underneath the border to attack our communities. And so Israel put restrictions on what could go into the Gaza Strip to try to make it difficult for Hamas to build tunnels, to build rockets, to build and import weapons that it wants to use against us. And it's tragic that Hamas has taken all the international aid that should have gone to the people of Gaza, all that concrete, and used it to build the tunnels that we have been exposing under schools and homes and hospitals as well. What does Hamas have to show for 16 years in government in the Gaza Strip? Absolutely nothing but poverty and misery. And we hope that after this war, when it ends with a strong and decisive Israeli victory, we will create new opportunities for Palestinians who realize that terrorism has only and will only ever lead them to disaster and to misery. And if they want a future of peace and prosperity, they need to accept that they live next to the state of Israel instead of trying to violently replace and destroy it. Right. Uh, Ilan, actually, I was going to ask you about, you know, what ha- what will happen to Gaza after the war? Um, how can it be rebuilt? And uh, also, more importantly, um, How can Palestinian people be freed from a force like Hamas? Uh, And how could you ensure that um, a new Islamist regime does not take over? Our campaign right now in response to the October 7 massacre is to end Hamas's reign of terror against our people, but also to end the Hamas terror regime in the Gaza Strip, which has been oppressing and subjugating Palestinians for far too long and subordinating the needs of the civilian population there in the service of the war machine that they have built to conduct the October 7 massacre. You know, we revealed just a few days ago a tunnel inside Gaza that is as wide as a subway line, and it extends for four kilometers. And Hamas used it for terror purposes. Gaza's problem has never been resources. It's been priorities. And Gaza decided to prioritize the October 7 massacre. Now, we're saying the day after Hamas, three things have to happen to create a future of peace and prosperity. One, the Gaza Strip must be completely demilitarized. There must be no terror army, no militias able to threaten Israel. And we will be responsible for ensuring that the Gaza Strip can never be used by another army of terror again. We will not accept any more threat to our people. The second thing is sustainable reconstruction. Gaza will have to be rebuilt in a way that ensures that the concrete goes to people's houses and not to tunnels. And the third thing is the most difficult. Gaza will have to be de-radicalized. We cannot have another generation of Palestinian children brought up on a diet of martyrdom and jihad and being taught by Hamas or by UN agencies, that they have a right to wage violent resistance and struggle to replace the state of Israel. We need them to be brought up to embrace peace and prosperity and partnership. And we need the world to tell the Palestinians some tough truths, that the state of Israel is here to stay, that it has a right to defend, ferociously defend its own sovereign borders, And their best hope is to embrace a future of peace instead of a future of Islamist extremism and violence. 
And if we can do those three things, demilitarization, sustainable reconstruction, and de-radicalization, then we can create new opportunities to lead our region towards a future of peace. One of the things that people who do not like you um, is that they call Israel uh, an apartheid state. Elon, can you tell us what is the truth about Muslims in Israel and also about the Palestinians who frequently visit Israel? Israel is a democratic state with a roughly 20% Arab minority. And that Arab minority has all the civil and political rights you would expect in a democratic state. They can vote and be elected. And we have Arab parties in the Knesset, the Israeli parliament. We have Arab judges, including on the Supreme Court. They're an integral part of our fabric. And I'll tell you something really amazing. At the moment, the polls show that the large majority of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank support the October 7 massacre and say that Hamas burning, beheading and raping people was the right decision despite everything that's happened to the Gaza Strip since. But you know what's really amazing? Since the October 7 massacre, we have seen more Arab citizens of Israel expressing identification with Israel and being proud of their own Israeli identity because they realize that the Jewish and democratic state of Israel is the best possible place to live in the Middle East for hundreds, if not thousands of miles around. And we're hopeful that we can continue on that path of integrating the uh, minorities within Israel as a democratic country that respects the rights of every minority community, including the many Muslims and Christians who dwell among us. We're creating a model of coexistence, of peaceful coexistence among minority groups. Now, uh, another thing that I want to ask you uh, about, Elon, is that with reference to Judea and Samaria, uh, which is inappropriately, uh, you know, referenced to as the West Bank, um, because the Western media seems to mostly parrot the, uh, the, the same narrative on that, um, what is the Israeli perspective on Judea and Samaria, uh, including the settlements? Uh, what is your side of the story? We refer to that territory that Israel captured from Jordan in 1967 as Judea and Samaria, because that is its original biblical name. Uh, we are not strangers in this land. This is our ancient homeland. The land of Israel is where all the stories of the Bible took place, where in ancient times the Jews had their ancient temples and ancient kingdoms before we began 2,000 years of exile and persecution around the world that ended with our return to our sovereign homeland in 1948. So we call that territory Judea and Samaria because that is where the ancient kingdoms of Israel and Judea existed. Now, around the world, many people call it the West Bank. Uh, because it's the West Bank of the Jordan River, and they want to emphasize its connection to the Arab world. But for us, that is the ancient heartland, the cradle of Jewish civilization, with places like Hebron and Shiloh and Jericho and places that simply pop out of the text of the Bible. This is the cradle of Jewish civilization, and this is why Israel has a presence there. Right. Uh, before uh, we wrap up this conversation, uh, finally, I want to also talk about the fact that Prime Minister Narendra Modi was uh, one of the first major world leaders to unequivocally call out the Hamas terror attacks. Um, and Indians, uh, as you might know, uh, on that uh, in the aftermath of the 7th October attack, um, made sure that there was a hashtag called Stand with Israel uh, that trended globally. Uh, because of the activity that was happening in India. Now, do you have any message for the people of India and for that matter, um, all people watching this? India's support has meant a lot to the people of Israel, but we need to see that support translated into action. India's vote at the General Assembly, for example, was disappointing. There were calls for a ceasefire that would leave the Hamas terror regime in power. And we needed India to stand together with our allies and vote against that resolution. 
and make it clear that after the barbaric terror attacks that have shocked everyone in India and your government has spoken out against, Israel is fighting a just war now to bring to justice the monsters who burned, beheaded, and raped innocent people and are threatening to do it all over again. The only way this war can end for the security of the state of Israel and the security of the whole of humanity is with the end of Hamas. And we need to hear our friends and allies, including the people in India whose support has meant so much to us, speak out in favor of Israel's right to win this war. Because Hamas started this war and we are going to end this war. We're going to end this war on our terms when there is no more Hamas and it can never again attack our people as it has been launching rockets against us for the last 20 years and as it shocked the world with the bloodiest massacre of Jews since the Holocaust on that dark morning of October 7th. Right. It goes without saying that we wish everyone in your country uh, and the region uh, with peace, security and dignity. Mr. Levy, thank you so much for your thank time you. today. Fine. Namaste and Shalom. Namaste. Shalom. Thank you. Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content and to support our work, please visit citti.net. Dhanavad. Namaskar.